So complex sleep disorders, yeah. So, hello everybody. My name's Gareth, Gareth Tudor Williams. I'm here on behalf of the Center for Pediatrics and Child Health, uh, presenting another in the lecture series that we've been putting together for trainees. And I am really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Rishi Parbury, who is a consultant in respiratory pediatric medicine at the Brompton Hospital, and is going to be talking about complex sleep disorders. Thank you very much, Rishi. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Gareth. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. So um, yes, I'm going to talk about uh, complex sleep disorders today. Um, I gave a previous talk uh, a few months ago about um, respiratory sleep disorders. So today we're going to focus more on um, uh, non-respiratory sleep disorders. I'm going to talk about um, some definitions about sleep and the physiology of sleep, um, how to investigate, and some of this will cross over with what we talked about in the first lecture in this series. And I'm just going to give a quick uh, run through of some common uh, non-respiratory sleep disorders. Um, talk about excess daytime sleepiness. This presents uh, quite frequently um, in our clinics and uh, then give you an over a summary of, of what we've talked about. So the definitions of sleep, the Oxford English Dictionary defines sleep as a condition of body and mind that typically recurs for several hours every night in which the nervous system is inactive the eyes closed, the postural muscles uh, relaxed, and consciousness partially suspended. Um, in medicine, we, we say it's a sustained quiescence in a species state accompanied by reduced responsiveness to external stimuli. And in mammals, we have a very quick reversibility to the wakeful condition because they have to be on high alert uh, in case of uh, threats, um, uh, evolutionary, uh, when we were you know, uh, living in caves, you need to be able to to quickly react to, to external stimuli. And specifically in children, um, it affects every aspect of their health and daily functioning. And it's really important that we maintain um, good sleep for physical health and cognitive performance. And there's a whole host of studies that show that sleep problems in children don't just impact the child themselves, but have a huge impact on the whole family. And we know that any disorders disrupting sleep is really important. Uh, particularly during uh, childhood due to CNS maturation continuing and developing areas of the brain being more vulnerable to injury. So functions of sleep are uh, normal growth and development, um, restoration of brain metabolic function, and I'll talk to you a bit later on about how um, there's remodeling of synaptic function during sleep. Um, it's a bit of a fallacy that you conserve energy during sleep because actually when you sleep 50, uh, eight hours, you only actually save uh, 50 calories compared to what you would have done if you were awake. Um, it forces us to be mobile, which uh, is necessary. Some people say that they can get by without sleep, but actually you do need to have enforced immobility to give your muscles uh, and, uh, time to recover from uh, the exertions of, of the day. And sleep deprivation is dangerous. So um, there's studies that suggest that if you are have 17 hours of sustained wakefulness, so pretty standard for um, doctors doing night shifts. That's the same as um, drinking two glasses of wine in terms of your response times. And uh, sleep deprivation has been linked to um, these disasters. So Exxon Valdez, uh, the oil spill, the, the Chernobyl disaster, and also the Challenger disaster have all been um, associated with uh, sleep uh, deprivation. So what causes sleep? The sleep-wake cycle depends on the interaction of two different processes. So there's process C, which is the circadian wakefulness drive. And uh, the 24-hour period is established primarily through your body secreting melatonin, which is influenced by light exposure. And this is why if you take melatonin um, as a supplement, some people get a very good response uh, in overcoming jet lag as the, you trick your body into thinking that um, is a different part of the night uh, day cycle. And other Zeep biggers also play a role. Um, Zeep biggers are any external or environmental cue that entrains um, or, or synchronizes an organism's biological rhythm to the Earth's 24 hour dark, light dark cycle. Um, and then there's process S, 
which is your homeostatic sleep drive. So C is the wakefulness drive, S is the sleep drive. And this gradually increases when you're awake. So the more you're awake, the more process S uh, starts to accumulate. And you get sleep onset when there's increasing sleep pressure. So process S, which interacts and intersects with decreasing process C. And this is when you fall asleep. And there's a complex uh, physiological, psychological and behavioral components into this interaction, which we don't have time to go into today, um, but it's been um, hugely studied. Um, so this uh, explains what I've just um, outlined. And this is a very good uh, graph from uh, this paper, which is actually done uh, in uh, this paper on zebrafish. So although sleep consumes a lot of our life, um, about a third of our lifespan, we don't really understand uh, that much about how it's initiated, maintained and terminated. And to address these questions, lots of alternative model systems have been uh, suggested and the diurnal zebrafish is um, really interesting. Um, it promises the, that we can bridge the gap between simple invertebrate systems, which show little neuro neuroanatomical uh, link to mammals, uh, but also it's got a complex nocturnal murine uh, marine system as well. What we can do with zebrafish larvae is you can monitor them in a high throughput fashion and pharmacology test them by adding compounds to the water. You can genetically screen them uh, using um, transient transgenesis and you can optogenically manipulate them in a non-invasive manner. So by changing their, their light exposure, you can uh, investigate their uh, sleep-wake cycle uh, quite successfully. And this uh, graph is uh, taken from work in the zebrafish and it basically summarizes what I said before. You can see process uh, S in the red and process C in, in the blue. And as um, the homeostatic sleep pressure drops and the circadian arousal drive uh, drops, these two intersect uh, to wake you up. But when they're furthest apart, you, um, you then fall asleep and you can see the night day cycle very nicely in that in that graph. So the sleep-wake cycle is linked to the light-dark cycle. Um, circadian rhythm is often talked about and this comes from the Latin uh, circa and uh, diem, uh, which means uh, approximately and day. And uh, this is driven by the, by the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hypothalamus. There's lots of different sleep drivers, the solitary tract nucleus, the wraith nucleus, and uh, melatonin, uh, which everyone knows about, but also serotonin, adenosine and uh, various uh, other cytokines such as IL-1 and TNF-alpha. And alertness is um, also another uh, system which uh, leads into this, but again, uh, this is beyond the scope of this uh, talk. Um, this uh, diagram here shows you the sleep-wake cycle and you can see that um, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you get a sharp rise in blood pressure, melatonin secretion then stops you know, around half past seven, uh, your bowel movement is likely in the morning and then you get your highest testosterone peak, you get high alertness by mid-morning and then uh, as the day uh, goes on your temperature goes up, your blood pressure increases and then later on your melatonin secretion starts and this is what uh, lends you to fall off to sleep and you can see that the melatonin if this is um, driven by light and dark, if you um, um, have an effect on this cycle, you can see how this might get disrupted very easily, which is what happens when you fly and you get uh, jet lag. So we look at uh, sleep using a number of different uh, investigative tools. And um, all of these tools, I, I don't tell you the sleep stages, the only way you can stage sleep is through the PSG, the polysomnogram, um, which is the gold standard for looking at sleep. Um, this is very labor intensive and I'll show you a few PSGs a bit later on, but uh, this is what we do if we really want to look uh, deeply into um, the, the brain uh, as you're sleeping. So the PSG will basically show you different uh, brain rhythms um, by applying electrodes to the head. Um, and so this, this shows the alpha rhythm, um, uh, which is the awake rhythm. And you can see here it's, it's quite uh, high um, hertz. And then when you go drowsy, you can see a change there. And in non-REM sleep, which is slow wave sleep, you have stage one and stage two, uh, N1 and N2, and you have stage three uh, non-REM sleep. This is what we call slow wave sleep. There used to be an N4, but now this is merged with N3. So um, I can show you some 
examples of that later. And then you have REM sleep, so rapid eye movement sleep, which is when your motor activity is inhibited. And th this basically goes from a non uh, deep to deeper sleep as you go through the stages of sleep. And um, we'll see later on that actually, if you go straight into REM sleep, this can actually be a, uh, a pathological uh, phenomenon. And this is what we know as narcolepsy. And I'll show you some information about that later on. So non-REM and REM sleep alternate. And in between each, you get brief arousals, and then you return rapidly to sleep at the end of each cycle. Uh, Non-REM, so slow wave sleep, predominates in the first third of your uh, sleep cycle. And then you get more REM uh, towards the end of the night uh, if your um, sleep is being, uh, going through the normal stages as it should. So this is examples of EEG. So um, N1, uh, so non-REM stage one sleep, you have a very low arousal threshold. It lasts less than 10 minutes. You have a high frequency um, uh, alpha waves, eight to 13 Hertz, and it's about two to 3% of sleep. Uh, N2, this lengthens uh, during the course of the night and you get these sleep spindles, which you can see here and K complexes. This is how we uh, stage sleep by looking at the EEG and then you can see how a person is going from one stage uh, to another and uh, this um, has a slightly uh, the hertz are slightly more 12 to 14 hertz and it's 50 percent of sleep so our sleep physiologists will look at this and be able to stage the sleep by looking just at the, um, the EEG um, in, in real time. Uh, N3 is much slower so less than two hertz and this represents 14 to 32% of sleep. And then in REM sleep, you have very high brain activity. Um, you have a sawtooth pattern and you have, uh, this is about 20 to 25% of sleep uh, in adults and in infants. So I'll show you in the next few slides, they have a much higher proportion of, of REM sleep. And you can see the, the REM sleep pattern here and the, uh, the, the, the non-REM uh, delta sleep there. So as I said before, stage one is sleep rate transition, your two to 5% of your sleep time. And this is when you would have your um, hypnagogic experiences. So most people will um, know this is a dreamlike sensation where you, you may feel like you're falling or hearing voices. Um, you may also get your jerks. So when people fall asleep, you might think about when you're you know, laying on your hand or on, on an airplane and you suddenly drop off and you, and you jerk, that's, that's you entering your stage one non-REM sleep. Uh, stage two uh, is where you get the initiation of true sleep. And this is 50% of the sleep time. And it's between five to 25 minute cycles. This is when you're less aware of your surroundings. Um, as I mentioned before, you have the sleep spindles and K complexes that help you establish this is different from stage one sleep. And then you go into stage three sleep, which is even deeper, um, 30 to 45 minutes, and then you arouse. Um, and this is where you get muscle relaxation uh, and a flat EMG uh, on your uh, uh, PSG uh, trace. So REM sleep is what we call active sleep. This typically is at 70 to 100 minutes after sleep onset and lasts less than 10 minutes. And over the course of the night, your REM uh, gets longer. And this is really important because if you're depriving yourself of sleep, then you won't get enough REM sleep. And I'll, I'll show you later on why REM sleep is important and uh, why you, know, you may not be um, you know, um, doing all of your physiological move, um, requirements by, by cutting your sleep time down because you'll get your non-REM sleep, but you'll get, le le you'll get less REM sleep if you don't sleep for your uh, required amount of time. And this actually varies from person to person. There is no set amount of time that one person should be sleeping. And a very good way to determine how much sleep you actually need is to fall asleep and let yourself wake up naturally for a week at a time. Uh, you know, this happens when you're on holiday and that kind of tells you how much sleep you need. Quite often you're catching up, so it may not be um, accurate at first, but after you've, you know, reset your body clock for a few days, if you're then having a nice period of time where you can go to sleep and wake up naturally, this kind of tells you what your, your ideal amount of sleep time should be. Um, the, uh, REM uh, is desynchronized on the EEG and it's very similar to your awake EEG. Um, this is why during um, PSGs we have video recording as well to make sure that we can definitely say that the patient is definitely asleep and not awake because those EEGs do look similar uh, when you're in a deep sleep and when you're awake. 
And this is when your brain metabolic activity is its highest. This is when you're dreaming. And it's also when you have absence of skeletal muscle tone and you lose your thermoregulation. Your heart rate is very variable, your respiratory rate is variable, and your blood pressure is variable. So sometimes when we do sleep studies, we don't do a PSG, we can see that you're in presumed REM because you can see if you've got your SATS monitor and your heart rate monitor on, you can, you can see that there's periods very defined where the heart rate and respiratory rate become more variable and you know that the patient most likely then is in REM even without um, having a, a, an EEG on the head. And this is quite often what we use for children because obviously um, putting all these probes on, on a small child is quite difficult. Uh, and during REM is where you get um, a loss of your respiratory drive. And in my first talk, um, this is where I showed you that this is where you get increased sleep disorder breathing related to respiratory conditions because your respiratory drive is, is least in this time. Your muscles are the most floppy. So this is where you're most likely to have obstructive sleep apnea because your airways um, are much more, uh, the tone is much more reduced in REM sleep than non-REM sleep. So as I showed, uh, said before, the, the sleep cycle, non-REM and REM alternate throughout the night in cycles and it varies with age. You can see, and these are the hypnograms. And uh, in children, um, you can see that um, they have uh, more uh, REM and more periods of REM. And as you become adults and elderly, your REM is uh, later in the night and shorter in duration. So at six months, the non-REM REM cycle is 60 minutes and in older children and adults, it's about 90 minutes. And children can be classified into these stages by about six months before then you can't really uh, do this because the cycles are so close together. Again, this is more hypnograms and you can see at two months, you're, you're trying to do the REM non-REM and it's, it's quite difficult because there's lots and lots of um, uh, REM periods quite close together. But as you can see from about six months, they become less. And at 12 months, you can see definitive uh, longer periods of non-REM sleep at the beginning of the night with REM then uh, later on in the night. And as you become older, as I said before, you get more REM towards the end uh, of the night rather than at the beginning. And this shows you again that um, when you're born, half of your sleep is REM sleep. By the time you're 90, very, when about 20% of your sleep is, is REM. The sleep requirements change uh, with age as well. So newborns need about 16 hours a day. And uh, these numbers uh, decrease as you get older. But as I said before, you know, there is no right or wrong answer. And there's a famous um, article recently of a, a head teacher that tried to uh, insist that all teenagers went to bed at half past nine and woke up at half past six. And this would help them uh, pass their exam. But actually, this is a complete uh, fallacy because what would happen if you try to go to sleep at a time that's not right for you is you just stay awake um, in bed and uh, you're you're not able to sleep at that time so there is no right amount of sleep for everyone and, and doing a one-size-fits-all is not necessarily uh, the way to go about this and this is why we um, we have sleep and it's for uh, for this kind of uh, problem um, with us and at the Amina hospital um, nap patterns, uh, babies nap uh, frequently, three, three naps a day, generally uh, under the age of six months, down to two and then one, and then above three, you should have been having one to no naps, and then after five, definitely having no naps, because this will interfere with your, your nocturnal sleep. So moving on to sleep disorders, it's very simple, simple to classify them into intrinsic, so things that are inside the body extrinsic so environmental causes of sleep disorders. So shift work um, is one of these and uh, that also comes under the alteration of circadian rhythm, uh, which um, can cause uh, sleep disorders. And uh, the American Sleep Society uh, classifies these in eight different ways. And I talked about um, breathing uh, disorders uh, in my first talk. I don't have time to go through all of these today, but uh, we will talk about some of these um, uh, disorders in children a bit later on. So how do you investigate? I've already uh, mentioned a lot about the, uh, the PSG to stage sleep, but we do have much uh, simpler uh, things that we start off with. So as with everything, uh, history and examination, there's the bare five sleep domain questionnaires. So we look at bedtime problems, you know, our children, um, being difficult being put to bed and what's causing this uh, ex time, ex excessive daytime sleepiness, 
you know, this can be due to respiratory problems, which I talked about before, but also um, other things, which we can talk about later on. Uh, we asked about awakenings during the night. Do children wake up frequently? Is this due to them needing to use the bathroom? Is this due to obstructive sleep apnea? Um, we asked about regularity of sleep and duration of sleep. And the questionnaire has developmentally appropriate trigger questions as well. There's also the Sherman questionnaire, which has been shown to be quite good in uh, teasing out um, obstructive sleep apnea. But um, we did a study for Ormond Street uh, a few years ago that showed that children who have underlying medical conditions, um, you know, neuromuscular conditions or developmental delay, uh, these kind of questionnaires are not as useful in teasing out um, sleep disorders. So what we generally like to do as a first line is a sleep diary. So we ask the parents to, uh, to take this home and then just fill in you know, when the child fell asleep, when the child was awake, what happened before sleep, was there a bedtime routine? And, and this can be very, very helpful. Um, and this basically is, is quite busy, but I just it shows you the, the domains that we ask about. So difficulty falling asleep, is there a habitual bedtime? Do we make uh, children go to sleep at a certain time in the week, but then at weekends they go to sleep much later? This is not ideal and can disrupt people's sleep pattern. We ask about how long it takes people to fall asleep. People quite often don't know. They think it takes longer than it does. And we're, we're often able to, you know, to surprise them when we do the, the studies and say, actually, your sleep latency, the time it took you to fall asleep was actually only a few minutes. We ask about family history. We ask about negative associations. So are they worried about things? I'll talk a bit later about restless legs. So some patients can feel that their legs are moving all night and then they, they worry about this and then they find it difficult to fall asleep. Other patients find it difficult to stay asleep. So we ask about mood and anxiety. We ask about family history again. We screen for primary sleep disorders. So if you've got obstructive sleep apnea, you will struggle to stay asleep because your brain will tell you to wake up because you're not breathing and you're having pauses in your breathing. And again, we can pick this up on sleep studies. You can have excessive daytime sleepiness. This is if you don't sleep enough during the night. Um, you ask about how they wake up in the morning. So if you have waking headaches, it can suggest you've got CO2 retention, which suggests you're hyperventilating at nighttime, which can be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, children can find it difficult to stay awake in the classroom. So we ask about what happens, do they fall asleep? Uh, older children, um, do they fall asleep in front of the TV? Adults can be very dangerous falling asleep driving. So we need to ask about all of these things. In older children, we ask about caffeine use, uh, nicotine. Uh, this can also uh, cause you to stay awake because they can be highly stimulant in their effect. And you can get other symptoms associated with excessive sleepiness, so cataplexy, which I'll show you later on, uh, sleep paralysis, sleep attacks. Um, and you get issues with daytime sleepiness if you use certain uh, sleeping tablets, so they can have a hangover effect. Substance abuse also can cause excessive daytime sleepiness. And one of the main things in, in children is a poor sleep routine. So, you know, um, the, the computers before bedtime, phones in the bedroom, um, substance abuse and parental involvement. So setting limits and making sure they have a specific bedtime. And actually what we're finding with adolescents, you know, we're saying take the phone out of the room, but we're now suggesting actually the whole family should take the phones out of the bedroom so it's consistent and have these, you know, charging, um, stations that you just plug all the devices in at night time and, and keep these things out of the bedroom because uh, these have been shown to be really disruptive uh, to, to sleep patterns. Um, actigraphy, these are very useful devices. They're a wristwatch that you wear, much like a Fitbit. Uh, it monitors your activity levels and it's quite useful to give patients for a couple of weeks to take home. And then you can see their sleep-wake cycle. And this is an example of an output from an actigraph. And you can see there's very little movement between uh, midnight and about uh, 8 a.m. But then on certain days, so I suspect this is the weekend, you know, they're still uh, moving around a lot, um, uh, you know, much later on in, in the in the time frame. So th these are quite good to show over a two week period what's going on um, with very little, uh, you know, interference or, or, or need for any other intervention. We quite often use these for children with sleep disorders as a first line of the sleep diary to see whether or not what's being written in the diary correlates with what is um, being shown in the actigraph. And um, the quantification of sleep movements actually correlates really, really well with the full PSG. So we, we really like the actigraph as a, as a first line test. 
Um, other sleep studies, so we have oximetry that looks at oxygenation. This is quite good for screening for sleep disorders related to the breathing, and we do this in the community quite a lot. We have oxygen carbon dioxide studies, which uh, look at the oxygen and the transcutaneous CO2. And then we have uh, the full cardiorespiratory polygraphy that looks at the movement of the, of the abdomen and the chest. And then the full PSG, which is uh, multiple somnus graph uh, in Latin. And this um, uh, is what comes from polysomnogram. And the use of this varies according to center. In America, this is what's used um, everywhere. But in Europe, we, we rely more, more on the cardiorespiratory polygraphy because it's much more uh, child friendly. It doesn't need all the, all the uh, probes on the head. And we get more or less enough information about sleep disorder breathing related to respiratory conditions from this. It's only for you know much more significant um, uh, you know, neurological situations that we really really use the PSG. This is an example of an output from a of a PSG, and you can see we have a pressure row, we have a flow uh, at the nose, you get a snore uh, reading, and then we see the bands of the, the that are put around the stomach and the chest. And these should be moving uh, in line with one another. And you see, if they don't move in line with one another, you get paradoxical breathing, which can be a sign that um, you have some degree of obstruction. And this is shown here, um, where you can see that the, the bands are moving in opposite directions. And then you get a big desaturation because the flow has dropped. And then suddenly you will have a breakthrough breath, which you see here, which is your body telling you that actually you need to breathe because your oxygen levels are going down. This is classically what we see in obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which is very common in children who have big tonsils and adenoids and uh, need them taken out because this can happen um, hundreds of times across the course of the night. And as you can imagine, if this is happening, your, your sleep is incredibly disrupted. And then this has implications on learning and uh, your ability to stay awake the next day. <clears throat> um, the full PSG, again, you get the, uh, the bits I just showed you, then you also get the, the, the bit with the brain. And you can see that when you're not breathing and you suddenly breathe, you then get an arousal on the PSG, um, which you can also see very nicely in line with uh, the issues when you're not breathing. We don't really need to have all of this information. So that's why most of the time we just do a CR poly, because if we see that the child is having a big arousal here, it's, it's obviously going to be on the, on the PSG as well. So that's just a whistle stop tour of, of investigations. Um, uh, I can talk a lot longer on those, but we want to talk a little bit about common non respiratory sleep disorders. And I'm going to start with the most common. Uh, which is insomnia, and it's defined as a repeated difficulty with sleep initiation, consolidation or quality that occurs despite age appropriate time and opportunity for sleep. So um, this is very important because you have to give uh, children the opportunity to sleep at the right time of day. So if you're trying to keep a three year old awake for the whole day without a nap, you're then going to get problems with uh, disrupting the sleep cycle. So insomnia doesn't just mean not sleeping at night, it means any problem with having the sleep that you need. Um, and it's more common uh, with increasing age and in women, the prevalence is about one to 10% in the general population, but rises to about 25% in the elderly. And uh, quite often you have subclinical symptoms of psychiatric illness um, in people with insomnia. And generally there's a sudden onset um, that continues um, due to negative conditioning. So people that enter a cycle of insomnia will then start thinking about it. You know, I'm not sleeping, I'm gonna be terrible in the morning. You then start watching the clock so you don't sleep and you just get into this negative um, feedback loop uh, where your sleep gets worse and worse and then you get maladaptive sleep patterns as well. Um, and you do a PSG study on these patients and they are always normal because there is no underlying um, condition it's, it's something that has happened due to um, you having um, problems initiating sleep and then um, psychologically feeding back into it. In children, it's, it's relatively common, one to 6% in general pediatrics, but in um, children that have neurodevelopmental conditions, it's much more prevalent. It's really important to ask about it because uh, these are the kind of things that we can uh, help with. Um, we have behavioral insomnias of childhood and this, this most often presents as bedtime refusal of resistance, uh, delayed sleep onset, uh, and or prolonged nighttime waking that requires parental intervention. 
And behavioral insomnia of childhood is classified into three uh, categories. So you have the sleep onset association. This is where children have difficulty initiating sleep independently and associate falling asleep with certain conditions, such as the place, so the couch or the parent's bed, a person's presence, such as the parent or an activity, so being fed or being rocked. So if you don't have these things, then the child will not reinitiate sleep. So um, it's quite important with, with young children that you know if you are rocking them to sleep, you're aware that if they form this association, then you're gonna to have to do this every single time you're trying to get them to sleep. So it's important not to get into this pattern if you want to get away from doing this as the child gets older. Uh, sorry, in the limit setting type, uh, the child will delay the bedtime and they'll constantly refuse to go to bed, you know, five more minutes, five more minutes, you know, can I just play with the dog? Um, and the parent has difficulty setting the limits. And then this allows the bedtime to get delayed and delayed and delayed over the course of a period of time. And then if the child requires certain circumstances to initiate sleep and there are difficulties with um, parental limit setting, then you have the, the combined diagnosis. And this can be a big problem. You know, the child associates going to bed with rock later and the parent is up half the night rocking their child to sleep. Um, but this is behavioral and you can do behavioral interventions to uh, improve this. There's a multifactorial etiology. You can have underlying medical, psychiatric and developmental disorders. So obstructive sleep apnea and restless leg syndrome in particular can cause in childhood insomnia. Um, you can have functional impairments at school or at home from insomnia, and it creates a big burden on caregivers having to stay awake um, with their children uh, during this. And it's linked with inappropriate, inconsistent sleep or napping schedules. And this is really why we always say it's really important to have a, um, a schedule. And parents quite often have inappropriate expectations of napping outside of a child's developmental needs, or they implement inconsistent or inappropriate naps. For example, naps close to bedtime. And if you do this, the child then has difficulty regulating sleep. Um, as we showed you before, the sleep-wake cycle is very important. But if you let the child nap, very close to bedtime, we're then gonna have a problem with them sleeping throughout the night. So eliminating naps at appropriate age is really, really important and doing it at an inappropriate age will cause behavioral difficulties at bedtime. So this is why it's really important to know what is age appropriate for a child's sleep and not let the child sleep when it's inappropriate because it will then have knock on consequences later on. Uh, so managing childhood insomnia, um, behavioral interventions are the mainstay of treatment and benefits are seen in, in most children under five. And the main component is consistency uh, from the parents. So interventions may need to be modified, taking into account other issues. So if siblings are sharing a room, this can be a real problem because obviously if the, the children are different ages, this means that you know the child needs to be asleep at a different time and they wake up at different times and keep one another awake. And in older children, you need to do strategies to reduce arousals at bedtime, as I mentioned before, uh, phones um, at the devil uh, in, in the bedroom, you know, and we've, there's lots of studies have shown that children actually wake up at night and will then check their phone and then have difficulty falling back asleep again. So actually we think phones shouldn't be in the bedroom actually and it should be kept outside uh, once children are going to bed. We usually reserve medications for underlying conditions in childhood insomnia. So if child has ADHD as well, we can use clonidine, uh, which is an alpha agonist um, and melatonin. Um, but other agents can worsen daytime hyperactivity due to the hangover effects. We don't really like to use, um, you know, benzodiazepines uh, really in, in these patients. Um, children that have depression, antidepressants can help with insomnia and melatonin can help. And there are some children that have PTSD who have been given prednisone, which is a selective alpha, an alpha 2 antagonist, um, which can also help with childhood insomnia uh, associated with PTSD. But as I said, Generally, it's behavioral interventions and, and we don't really use medications unless there's a clear uh, underlying uh, other diagnosis such as these three. Um, this again is a very busy slide, but it's quite a good um, paper which basically summarizes uh, treatment methods for insomnia. Um, so you can see, you know, for all children, the bedtime routine is very important and you can take a series of sub subsequent steps in half hour prior to bedtime. So you complete the steps in the same manner each night. So you cue the initiation of bedtime 
Um, so basically, you know, you do a bath, and then you have a story, and you end in the bedroom. And for younger children, you can in incorporate picture charts, and you can also do uh, reward charts, so stickers when you complete each step. And as this routine becomes, you know, more ingrained, uh, the children will just associate each cue with going to bed. Um, other things on here, uh, for example, you know, positive routines. So for young children, if you implement a routine that is positive and enjoyable, so an interaction with the child or the pet, um, or doing the child's preferred activity, and then you praise them, then the child, you know, goes to bed. But if the child refuses a step or a tantrum, then you end the routine and you don't let the child have the time with the book or the dog, etc. And the interaction ceases, then they become they associate bedtime with positive things. And if they have a tantrum and don't go to bed, they don't get the positive things there. Um, the other thing that we find is, is, is quite useful is a faded bedtime. So you put the child to bed close to the time that he or she is most likely to fall asleep. And once they fall asleep uh, within 15 to 20 minutes, you then move the bedtime earlier and earlier uh, over the course of two to three nights. I think it's probably a bit quick. You move it earlier and earlier over the course of a couple of weeks until you get the bedtime that you actually want to achieve. And we find that can be quite quite helpful. So I'm going to move on to sleep related movement disorders. There's four of these really uh, in children. So sleep myoclonus of infancy, uh, rhythmic movement disorder, um, periodic limb movement disorder, restless leg syndrome. And um, all of these, the PSG with video is very useful to diagnose <clears throat> and differentiate. And the history is key uh, in all of these uh, situations. So sleep myoclonus of infancy, this is myoclonic jerks during sleep involving the limbs, trunk or the whole body. And they stop ab abruptly when the infant is aroused and parents can get quite stressed uh, when they see these, they, they see them median age of about three days. And it, you know, quite often uh, it looks like the child may be having a seizure. Um, and they spontaneously get better at the age of about uh, between two and 10 months, average being about two months. And the child's neurological examination is normal. The other thing is the PSG is completely normal and reassurance is key. As I said, first time parents particularly can get confused with uh, and be worried about epilepsy, but the PSG is completely normal. And it's quite useful, as I said before, phones are not great in the bedroom, but in this case, we actually do like phones because doing a video, um, you can demonstrate, you can quite clearly see the clusters of movements. Um, not associated with EEG activity. So even if you don't have a PSG, get the parent to video it. And we can see the limb movements that are typically bilateral, symmetrical, and they last generally a few seconds, but up to five minutes. They occur at any stage of sleep, um, most commonly when the child is just falling asleep. And you can sometimes provoke them. So if you've got the child in clinic and you're wondering if this is what happens, if you rock the child in a head to toe direction, you can provoke these, uh, these episodes. Uh, they are higher uh, in frequency in babies that are born to opioid dependent mothers, which can be quite tricky because obviously you have withdrawal in these babies as well. So it is important to bear in mind that, you know, in these mothers, they may have withdrawal, but it may also be uh, just benign sleep myoclonus. And there have been familial cases reported uh, with a possible autosomal dominant inheritance. Now, I have got a video. Um, I'm going to try and unshare and then share my other screen. So just give me a second. Um. I hope that is sharing. Yep. Yeah, we can see Perfect. that. So uh, this is a baby who has uh, benign sleep myoclonus. Uh, and you can see this is very typical. Both arms moving, the legs start twitching. And as you can imagine, first time parents seeing this, and it typically does occur on day three, day four of life. It hasn't occurred for the first two days. And we get quite a lot of anxiety about this, but it is completely normal and it will uh, resolve on its own without any intervention. I will go back to the other screen.
So, um, moving on to uh, rhythmic movement disorder. So this is um, when repetitive movements occur when you're drowsy or asleep, generally occurs during non-REM sleep uh, and is rare during REM. Um, it's uh, characterized by rhythmic humming or other sounds that can also occur. Um, rapid actions are seen at a variable rate and episodes last for about 15 minutes. They generally stop when a noise, a movement or a voice disturbs the child and children who are old enough to talk will not recall the events in the morning. Uh, it's normal in infants and children and it's only really a disorder if the movements are so severe that they injure the child or disturb sleep. But it can be very, very upsetting for other family members because the movements can be quite, um, uh, quite aggressive and, and quite uh, shocking and, uh, and they can come on at a very sudden onset. And there's several types of so body rocking, head banging, head rolling. And um, as in the um, benign sleep myoclonus, the PSG is also normal, but the accompanying video uh, is diagnostic. And rhythmic movement disorder is very, very common in uh, healthy infants and children. Body rocking generally begins around uh, six months of life. Head banging can start at around nine months of life. And about 60% of children um, at nine months of life will report at least um, one of body rocking, uh, head banging or head rolling with body rocking being the commonest. Um, by 18 months of life, only about a third of children still have these uh, rhythmic movements. And it commonly resolves by about two to three years of age. And by about five years of age, about 5% of children will still be doing uh, these movements. It's um, equally common in boys and girls. It's more likely to occur if other people in the family have had it. And one study has demonstrated that children with body rocking had higher levels of anxiety. It's quite rare in adults and teenagers, and it can appear in older adults due to injury to the central nervous system. Uh, and in younger children with autism, developmental delay, and other neurodevelopmental conditions, it can occur later uh, in their childhood as well. Uh, most children do not need help, as I've said, and it will get better as they improve, but uh, some children may need a prescription of benzodiazepines if the movements are so severe that it's causing uh, injury. And I'll see if I can get the video up again. This is a uh, rhythmic movement disorder in an adult. Um, you can see we have these cameras when we do it on children as well, some night cameras, and we can watch with the PSG running. You can see. We can't see it yet, Rishi. Oh, you can't. Okay, let me try again. Is it there now? Yep. Great. So this is an adult. Um, we didn't actually have any of children because we don't generally tend to do the PSG because it's um, we can generally diagnose it from the history. But uh, this is an adult with a rhythmic movement disorder. So the patient's asleep and uh, he's had these since childhood. And people are generally unaware that they're doing it uh, so it can be quite uh, upsetting for the bed partners. Um, but um, as I said, you know, older children don't generally remember in the morning and it's completely benign unless they're so severe that you're causing yourself an injury. But this is typically what you see. And as I said, the PSG will be completely normal apart from when this is happening, you will see movement, but no brain uh, arousal issues uh, or, or any seizure activity on the PSG. So that was rhythmic movement disorders. I'll move quickly on to periodic limb movement disorder. So um, this is um, where you get uh, limb movements at 50 to 90 second intervals, they're about five seconds and it's just repetitive jerks of the lower limbs and it's typically during non-REM sleep. It rarely also affects the arms, but mainly the legs. 
it affects four to 11% of the population. And as you get older, your risk increases. It's uncommon in children. Um, uh, and uh, the prevalence is less, so that should be less than 2% in otherwise healthy children. Parents are often unaware, as with uh, rhythmic movement disorder, um, it's bed partners or siblings that can be affected. And you can be excessively tired during the day because you're waking up at night because of these uh, leg movements. Risk factors in children are obstructive sleep apnea, uh, neuropsychiatric diagnoses, and if a parent has restless leg syndrome. Uh, the cause of periodic limb movement disorder is unclear um, if it's primary, but it can be secondary due to diabetes, iron deficiency, caffeine use, ADHD, and Williams syndrome. And it's often confused with restless leg syndrome, which I'll come to in a second. And you can see on this uh, epoch uh, that there's the other limbs at the bottom. And this is what you tend to see the limb movements um, periodically. And then you can also see that these are associated with uh, more movements of the thorax and abdominal bands as well. Uh, restless leg syndrome. This is quite often confused with periodic leg movements disorder. The difference is that this is not a sleep diagnosis. This occurs uh, while you're awake. And this is very common in uh, middle age and uh, even commoner in, in women. And it's just an overwhelming urge to move your legs. Um, and it's worse in the evening. <clears throat> or at night whilst you're awake. So people generally say they get into bed and they just can't fall asleep because they just want to keep moving their legs as opposed to PLMD, which happens when you're asleep and you don't necessarily have, um, you're not aware of it. This is you're just feeling like you need to move your legs. And as with PLMD, your arms are all occasionally also affected. And children quite often describe this as having an unpleasant crawling sensation in their feet, calves and thighs, where it's not very common in children, but this is how they will describe it if they do have this. And there's no obvious cause actually in most cases. It can be familial. Um, in some people there has been shown to be an abnormality in dopamine metabolism and it's actually very common in pregnancy. Uh, third trimester um, uh, people report that, they, that their legs just feel like they have to keep moving them all the time. And if there is no underlying cause such as pregnancy it's likely to persist and get worse. And the problem with this is that because you're aware of it you then have insomnia, you're going to get anxiety and it's been linked with depression and anxiety because people just feel like they can't stop moving their legs. As I said before, children less than 12, um, you need to have age appropriate de de descriptions of, of what's happening. They'll say that their spiders crawling um, on their legs or tickling their legs and it's associated with sleep onset and sleep maintenance insomnia. Treatment can include iron to keep ferritin levels greater than 50 because low iron can affect dopamine. Um, so if you do see restless legs, we do suggest iron supplementation and the improvements in sleep hygiene can be beneficial. So routine as before. And we have to assess the symptoms of ADHD and we do occasionally use benzos for severe cases. I'm aware of the time. So I'm quickly going to run through excessive daytime sleepiness. This is defined as the inability to stay awake and alert during major waking episodes of the, during the day. And it results in periods of irreprehensible need for sleep or unintended lapses into drowsiness or sleep. And it was linked with the uh, swine flu uh, vaccination, which I've shown here. There was an increase in um, uh, narcolepsy following this vaccination. True narcolepsy is actually very rare. Um, you know, you have um, excessive daytime sleepiness that can be due to obstructive sleep apnea, periodic leg movement syndrome, lessless legs true insomnia, um, true narcolepsy is actually very, very rare. Um, three to 10, 16 per 10,000, and it's a chronic lifelong central nervous system disorder that we have to diagnose using the PSG. Um, and it typically has onset during adolescence and it can be with or without cataplexy. And uh, as I said, you know, there was a massive increase. I think it was a 15 fold increase in children following uh, the swine flu vaccination and they suddenly develop narcolepsy within three months of, of having the vaccine. Um, pathophysiology is uh, it's due to loss of hypothalamic neurons that produce wake promoting neuropeptides, um, hypocretin and oxy, orexin one and two. And in children with narcolepsy and cataplexy, orexin is virtually undetectable in the CSF. So if you do a lumbar puncture, you can, you can look for this. It can be autoimmune, so triggered by viral infections or indeed a uh, vaccine. Um, and there's a genetic predisposition. And we can do a blood test to look for expression of 
um, human leukocyte antigen, uh, DQB10602. And this is a cell surface protein re responsible for regulating the immune system. And this one, um, we find that it's associated with narcolepsy. Uh, those who carry this gene um, have narcolepsy with cataplexy, but those who have narcolepsy without cataplexy do not tend to carry uh, this gene. So it's a good way of uh, uh, discriminating. Uh, symptoms um, can be excessive daytime sleepiness and sleep attacks, and you get hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations, the vivid auditory, tactile, sensory experiences, scary dreams uh, that reoccur in the sleep-wake transition, so just as you're nodding off. These patients also get sleep paralysis that can be quite distressing, so they feel like they're awake, but they can't move or speak for seconds or minute at, minutes at a time at sleep onset or offset, so they just feel like they're kind of literally paralyzed and it can be quite distressing. And then you have uh, cataplexy as well. So cataplexy is virt virtually pathognomonic of narcolepsy. It's seen in 60 to 100 percent of adult cases and 80 percent of pediatric cases and it's defined as an abrupt, abrupt complete or partial loss of muscle tone and it represents loss of muscle tone as seen during REM sleep and it's classically triggered by strong emotions such as laughter, anger or surprise and it's a variable spectrum, so you can just have the eyelids, the jaw muscles affected, right down to the patient completely collapsing onto the floor, which can also be quite dangerous. Uh, but your hearing and awareness are un undisturbed. Attacks are brief and reversible. I'm going to see if this works. I was having trouble with this one earlier. Let's see. Narcolepsy causes me to fall asleep uh, anywhere between 40 and 50 times a day on a good day, um, probably more than that on a bad day. Um, and it can be anywhere between a few seconds. Uh, if I'm sitting up, if I'm at home, then it can probably be more than that because if I'm comfortable, if I'm sitting on a chair, if I've got something to rest my head back on, it can be anywhere between sort of what, up to 45 minutes. Um, and it impacts massively on my life because it means that everything I do, I have to think about how much energy it's gonna take up, um, how long afterwards it's gonna take me to recover, and uh, if I'm gonna be safe, because um, it's not just falling asleep, but cataplexy as well, um, which can leave me quite vulnerable in certain situations, public transport, or if I'm by myself without a friend. Um, so it, it impacts on everything I do really because you just have to think about things that somebody who didn't have narcolepsy wouldn't, wouldn't have to think about before doing something simple. Even something like going swimming. I don't go swimming anymore because there's a risk that I could have cataplexy in the swimming pool and start drowning, which has happened before. So it's, it, it impacts, impacts massively. So, <laughs> and how to kind of try to describe it to them. I found over time. So, the diagnosis <clears throat> uh, is made on a PSG, and what we typically see is that the patient will go into REM sleep straight away rather than um, as they normally would after first going into non REM sleep. So, you can see uh, in the uh, left hand corner here. This is a normal hypnogram, and you can see how you uh, are awake and you enter the stages through sleep, and then you get your REM sleep here uh, after about 90 minutes, typically your first cycle in an adult. However, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see as soon as you fall asleep, you're immediately into REM, the very deep sleep. <clears throat> and obviously, I showed you before the PSGs and how the, the, um, the waveforms vary according to your sleep stage, so we can quite easily pick this up on the PSG and demonstrate that as soon as the patient falls asleep, they're entering REM. Um, what we also need to do is a multiple sleep latency test. So this is the night after the PSG. 
we schedule the patient for at least four, um, but up to five naps of uh, up to a 20 minute duration, separated by two hour intervals. It's a whole day study. Um, and basically we give them the opportunity to sleep. Uh, and the diagnostic criteria are that the mean sleep latency is less than eight minutes. There's two or more sore REMs. So this is sudden onset REM periods within 15 minutes of sleep onset or um, a sore REM the, on the preceding night may replace one on the MSLT. And this is how we have to make the diagnosis. So it's not enough just to be going straight into REM at night because this can actually happen if you had uh, a long period of sleep disturbance or insomnia. Um, you need to also have a positive multiple sleep latency test, which means that you're entering REM um, very quickly within 15 minutes of sleep onset and you are falling asleep very quickly as well uh, in the daytime naps. So sleep latency is defined as the time elapsed between nights out and the onset of stage one sleep and the sleep latency in the MSLT is averaged over the naps to yield the mean sleep latency. So it has to be less than eight minutes over the course of the naps for us to be confident that the patient does have narcolepsy. So the hypnogram from the MSLT here shows that in all five naps, the patient has achieved some onset of REM uh, in the, on the first nap here, uh, on the nap here, and on the nap uh, here as well. And essentially by doing this, we've, we've demonstrated that this patient has true narcolepsy. Um, as I mentioned before, um, HLA typing can also be used uh, as another test, lumbar puncture, to look for these uh, compounds. And the actigraph can also be helpful um, because it can show when the patient is sleeping um, and uh, pick up periods in the daytime when also there might be um, some onset of sleep as well. Management of narcolepsy is actually very, very complex. Um, it uh, needs MDT support. Uh, healthy sleep habits need to be uh, initiated. Patients sometimes need scheduled daytime naps. It can be very, very difficult to, you know, to hold down a job uh, and have a normal life with, with this. Uh, lifestyle changes can be useful. Weight management can be useful. And medications uh, are quite often needed. So psychostimulants that promote wakefulness uh, for excessive daytime sleepiness are used. So methylphenidate or modafinil. And you can use REM suppressors for cataplexy. So antidepressants such as fluoxetine or venlafaxine or sodium oxybate. Uh, this is a powerful sedative that's used to cataplexy, but it can also help with lots of other symptoms of narcolepsy, such as ex excess daytime sleepiness or sleep paralysis. And this is actually the most effective treatment for narcolepsy with cataplexy, but not all patients find it beneficial. Um, it's quite a tricky um, uh, condition to manage and let's be on the scope of this talk because we could do a whole uh, hour session on this alone but this is just a brief overview of, of what we what we sometimes need to do to help these patients. So in summary uh, sleep is vital for normal growth and development in children. Um, respiratory physiology is significantly altered during sleep and in my first talk I spoke about how breathing difficulties are much more likely to manifest uh, during sleep and especially during REM sleep. Uh, sleep studies are very useful in guiding the management of these patients. Um, you need to pick the appropriate test to the appropriate clinical question. So, you know, if a patient has insomnia, you don't need to do a PSG. You can get that from the history. But if you're having a child that's suddenly falling asleep out of the blue at school and it wasn't happening before, clearly you need to do a PSG and an MSLT to rule out uh, narcolepsy. Um, we also use sleep studies in weaning respiratory support and starting respiratory support. And um, they can be very helpful in alerting to an unexpected change in the clinical condition. I uh, showed in my previous talk that we had a child with a Chiari malformation and they suddenly had much more central apneas on their sleep study. And we then referred back for neurosurgical opinion and it was discovered that the frame and magnum uh, uh, had, had become more narrow and actually surgery was required for decompression and this was what was causing uh, the increase in sleep and central sleep apnea, which could have been uh, fatal if it hadn't been picked up. So it's quite useful uh, in picking up uh, other undetected and unexpected changes in clinical conditions. There are many non-respiratory sleep disorders. I've gone through them very quickly today, um, but common things are common. 
Uh, sleep hygiene is generally the most important and useful intervention in all of these children. Um, you know, you, you take the history and you find out that, you know, they're going to sleep at a certain time in the week, but at the weekend, they are sleeping to one o'clock and that's clearly not the, not the right way to go if you're trying to establish a good sleep-wake cycle. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, leg movement uh, conditions can all cause daytime sleepiness. True narcolepsy is very, very rare. And uh, the history is usually key and we have strict criteria um, on how we make this diagnosis. And uh, I'll finish with uh, W.C. Fields, who said that sleep is the most beautiful experience in life, except for drink. Um, and uh, you're welcome to send me any questions uh, if you want to ask me anything. Thank you. Rishi, thank you. What a fantastic talk and a really wide ranging um, uh, exposure to complex sleep disorders. Very, very helpful. Can I just ask you one thing that early on in the talk, you were talking about some of the um, factors that are known to be involved in, in sleep, and you mentioned IL-1 and TNF-alpha, and I just wondered whether it's not something I'd ever thought about, but we inevitably with some of the inflammatory disorders that we, we treat, um, we're using anakinra and infliximab and etanercept and are they associated with, with, with disturbed sleep when you start using monoclonals that are interfering with IL-1 and TNF-alpha? Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that, Gareth. I mean, I don't think I've got enough experience of using them. Um, I don't think I've read about it either. But I can No, I don't think I've read about it either, but it's something... I mean, that, that, that is the other issue, is that we are actually very bad as, as general clinicians and uh, specialists in other fields. I, I think the respiratory team are by far the best at, at, at establishing sleep disorders and asking about sleep, but we're not very good about asking about sleep. Yeah, I think... Don't um, you find that? Yeah, I think it's an increasing... Um, you know, there's increasing awareness about it. I mean, respiratory, we ask about the respiratory side of things. I'm, you know, relatively new to the other side of things, but um, the Evelina do have a dedicated non-respiratory um, uh, sleep clinic, which we're now also doing at the Brompton. So I think there is an increasing awareness of it. And actually um, we're training our physiologists now to also do uh, lots of the sleep hygiene uh, things. They're gonna become sleep practitioners and uh, mm. actually mm. more of a not just looking at the physiology of it but actually looking at the you know the other um impacts that we can do you know so sleep hygiene is so important you know some of the the tables that i showed you you know if you implement, if you, if you implement those stages uh, effectively and, and stick to it you can quite often you know transform the, the child's sleep cycle in a quite a short space of time mm. Yeah, that's very rewarding. I mean, the other thing is that I, I thought the videos were very powerful and um, the benign neonatal sleep myoclonus, that video that you show is kind of a central viewing. It's central viewing, I think, for pediatricians because it, it was actually much more prolonged and rhythmic than I had experienced, you know, just in, in my practice and, and listening to families. And, and I think that was a very useful uh, and reassuring uh, video to, to realize the the how how, sig how significant it can look yeah and exactly. yet be I mean, totally it, benign yeah absolutely i mean you know the first time i thought i was you know you know as an sho it's you know you think that something's happening and actually um it is i mean it's not totally unexpected but you would see other things if it was seizure activity you know the fact that it results quickly it's short-lived you know and and it's very very common so i think you know um it is useful to to, to see the video and 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 know what it looks like yeah great well thank you for bringing all those resources together and i'm sure people will contact you about uh, additional questions all the best thank you very right. much Rishi. no problem thanks a lot gareth i'll see you soon all right cheers thanks bye